Hey guys, Ryan here. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to let you guys know that starting on Tuesday, February 6th, and going through March 5th, I'm going to be running a weekly Kill Team League at Millennium Games here in Rochester. $30 for the ticket, prizes for first, second, third, best painted, and best sportsmanship. Link down in the description below. Warzone Studio was kind enough to send out a couple of their battle mitts for us to review, and I have to say, you guys, I absolutely love them. The mats we received have the kill team layout on them, making it quicker and easier to place objectives and terrain pieces to create a good play experience. The mouse pad material the mats are made from is an upgrade from the foldable cardstock boards that you are used to seeing come in kill team boxes. Warzone Studio are even helping support the channel by giving us a kickback for each order placed using the link in the description below. So make sure to check them out and thank you to Warzone Studio for sponsoring this video. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Command Point, and specifically, Ryan, welcome to the Legionary Deep Dive, the long-awaited. Do we have a little, what's going on here? The Chaos I, Gods I are, think the Chaos <laughs> Gods are with us today, They're with Shane. us in the studio. Yeah. Oh, that was weird. Anyway, long-awaited, much anticipated. Mm -hmm. The masses have been clamoring. And it couldn't have come at a better time. Yeah, really. Since uh, they're... <laughs> apparently on their way out yeah, potentially so yeah the, the meta's not been good for them mm -mm. but uh you know i've been playing this team for the last year basically and i'm shelving them so that means we're going to talk about him so i am shane uh and i am joined here by my co-host ryan ryan how are you hello i'm good i'm good i'm excited to talk about these chaos legionaries and uh do a deep dive yeah, we haven't done a proper deep dive in a long time, mm -mm. and uh, this one has been a long time coming, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we're going to basically, the structure of this is we're going to go over the the actual, um, we're going to go through the models one by one. We're going to uh, go over the different marks of chaos, of which there are four, five if you include undivided. Um Go over the ploys, go over the, you know, the equipment, and then we're going to get into the, like, the uh, deeper... I guess, strategy mm -hmm. into playing Legionaries. So Legionaries are an elite team, and that means there's only six models on the team. So um, I think they are one of, if not the most popular team. They're always a top three most popular team just by virtue of being Marines. Yeah. I feel like them and just like intercession at yeah. typical, you know, tournaments are neck and neck for the past six months it's pretty much pretty much been those two in commandos like as the most taken teams yeah in every tournament um but yeah no we're, we're gonna we're gonna get into it we're gonna get into the weeds ryan so um i guess first of all they are like i said they're a six model team they have access to the seek and destroy and security archetypes um very quickly i'll say that in my year of playing i've never taken security never. with yeah. legionnaires i do like security more than most players I've found, but I think elite teams with security is just not a very good mix. No, I don't. I think a lot of security. Um, if you're not a very killy team, and you've got a lot of bodies, security I think has merit. But uh, mm -hmm. legionnaire is the direct opposite of the things I just said. Yeah, they have very few bodies and they're extremely killy. So you take seek and destroy. Um, the only other thing I'm going to touch on tech op wise is. Don't take the faction TAC Ops if you're playing competitively. They are garbage. You don't need them. I don't even know what they are. Because <laughs> we, I don't think we've ever... We, we, we'll, we may yeah. have tried them like once or twice. Yeah, we'll talk about them. We'll do a brief thing later. But, I mean, I've gotten to the point where... I mean, at Worlds and Group Stage, I didn't... I, first of all, I haven't been taking faction TAC Ops to this team the whole year. At Worlds, I didn't take any, and I maxed TAC Ops every game. So you don't need a good, cool faction TAC Ops Legionnaires. They're really good at Seek and Destroy. So there you go. Uh, but we're going to talk about the operatives, Ryan. So um, I guess getting started here, um, we're going to talk about the leaders. So there are two leaders. Yeah. Um, there is the aspiring champion and there's the chosen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a hot debate over which leader to go with. So 
Is it really? Well, some people, it's kind of become less of a debate. Yeah. But let's start with the aspiring champion. Okay. So um, uh, you'll notice these models are three APL. There are Marines. Um, three up saves. The leader gets an extra wound, so sitting at 13 saves. Mm-hmm. And the aspiring champ has a lot of different, like, choices here. And I think there's a lot of good choices. The The gist of it is he's going to have a really good melee weapon, whatever you take. Yep. I like the power fist a lot and the power weapon. Those are my two favorites. Um, and you're going to give him a plasma pistol always. He's got that tainted bolt pistol, but you could just throw that in the garbage. Yep. Don't ever take it. It's nasty anyways. Yeah. Um, it's gross and tainted. So uh, plasma pistol hits on twos. Not a lot of models have plasma that hits on twos, so you're just going to take that and run with it. Um he has the in the eyes of the gods ability, which I think is the main reason I like the aspiring champion more than the chosen. A hundred percent. In the eye of the gods basically says during his activation, once per turning point, if he kills an enemy operative, he can do another action for free. So this is really cool. My favorite use of this, I think the most useful way I've used it is on Into the Dark, putting him up against a closed door. Uh, on the other side being uh, presumably an enemy objective with some enemies in the room. Mm-hmm. He's basically for APL. Yeah. Because he can open the door, charge, kill something, shoot something. Yeah. Um, worth noting, too, a uh, little fun interaction that some people don't think about. Say if you're in melee, you start your activation in melee, somebody charges you and pass or something. If um, And you're maybe you're in combat with two guys. If you kill a guy in melee and you're still in combat with another guy, or say it's Vekgard, and they use In-Death Atonement to lock you down, Yeah. in the eyes of the gods, you can make a free fallback action, even though it's two APL. Because it doesn't say a free one APL. You don't get a free one APL. You get to do a oh, free action. Oh, so okay. kill something, fall back for free, then shoot another guy. Um, if you do that, your opponent will cry. So uh, do that. Okay. And it's cool. Yeah. Um, Aspiring Champion, very good. Uh, the other option, uh, less popular, and I think less good, is the Legionary Chosen. So... He takes the Demon Blade. It's a really good melee up and fight. It's like a power weapon with crit damage seven. Mm-hmm. That's the only difference, really. Um, and he has a plasma pistol, which you take, but you'll notice that this guy hits on threes, whereas the champ hits on two. So right off the bat, not as good. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't have that in the eyes of the gods ability that is really, really, really good. He does have a couple other things. He's got demonic aura. So whenever an enemy falls back from him, um, they can only fall back four inches. Or I guess they can fall back one circle less. So this shouldn't be happening very often. Um, if he's charging things, he's probably killing them. You're not ending up in combat very often. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, with nothing left over. Uh, and then he's got the Soul Feast ability, which is the more interesting one here, where basically whenever he uh, fights, if he uh, if he's alive at the end of the fight and he did a crit in melee, uh, he regains two lost wounds. So this is fine. It makes him kind of like a little more sustainable in melee. Um Again, it's fine. It's it's not great. Yeah. It doesn't make up for the two-up ballistic skill on the plasma that the aspiring champ gets, and it's not as good as in the eyes of the gods. So yeah. I think you're defaulting a lot of the time to the aspiring champion. For sure. All right, Ryan. What specialist do we want to talk about next? Because they've got a few. Um, Let's make it easy. Let's talk about the gunner. The gunner? Yeah. The classic gunner? Yeah. Uh, so the gunner, uh, you know, he there's nothing super special here. It's your average... You know, um, gunner options, flamer, melt gun, plasma gun. The melt gun's awesome. So good. You know I like the melt gun. Love the melt gun. Plasma gun's awesome. It's great. It's great. You should have it. The flamer, um, I said recently Oh no. to somebody that if they, maybe I would take a flamer if, like, if they buffed legionary and they said you could take a seventh guy, but he had to have a flamer. I think that's the situation. Kind of like what happened with commandos. Yeah. Then I take a flamer. So if I literally got it for free and had to give nothing up, then I would take a flamer. So <laughs> I guess in other words, the flamer is kind of the worst thing you could possibly build. It's the worst thing on this team. Yeah. Don't build the flamer. What's next? Uh, what about the gunner's big brother? The heavy, the heavy gunner. gunner. Ooh. <laughs> The heavy gunner is. There's uh, a lot of. There's. Uh, you gotta. These are all great options mm-hmm. for this heavy gunner. Each one has like a different situation um, that you could use it in. I guess like the Reaper chain cannon, like lately we've been higher on that than the heavy bolter. Yeah. Um, and the missile launcher certainly has its place as well with that crack profile. 
Blast 2 also, not Blast bad. Blast 2 is, I think, the reason you would ever take the missile launcher. Yeah. I think in the in the Chaos Cult melee meta, I thought about taking a missile launcher. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the use case for that. Um, the Heavy Bolter, I will, I'll break down the situations where you use each of these. Heavy Bolter is really good if you are double shooting. Um, a lot of people used to take Heavy Bolter just so they could do the double shoot and shoot twice with it, which is a really strong thing if you can do it. The problem is it doesn't come up as often as you want it to come up. And if you're double shooting, that means you're probably moving, shooting, shooting, and then you're out in the open. Um, so it's a little difficult there. Uh, I will say if you're playing Zinch, the Heavy Bolter is always the best. And we'll go over the marks later. But okay. just important to note that you're going to get that P1 off more often if you're taking Zinch. Um, but as far as if you're not double shooting, which, spoiler, you're you're not going to double shoot as much as you think you are. So if you're not double shooting, the Reaper Chain Cannon is always the best single target gun. So just the math on it, it's six shots on threes, damage three, five, ceaseless, fusillade, and heavy. Um, don't worry too much about fusillade. Uh, there is a little fusillade tech that I've used in the past, but we're not going to get too into the weeds on that. Um, the It doesn't have AP. The weapon damage is lower on the normal damage, but the ceaseless and the six shots means that this actually, against it, unless you're playing Zinj, this is better against just about anything. Um, maybe not like a... Uh, probably not like a rubric marine because of all mm-hmm. his dust, he'll get a two-up save. But everything else, just take the Reaper Chain Cannon if you're taking a Heavy Gunner, uh, if you're not Zinch. So it's just the math is the best. It's really good. Gotcha. Uh, so I think now we should talk about, I think this is your favorite model. We got to talk about the Anointed. Oh, yeah. We do have to talk about the Anointed. Mm-hmm. So the Anointed... For a long time, I've been saying, you know, the number one most important thing with Legionnaires is to just always take the Anointed. So he's got five attacks on threes, four, five, rending and melee, um, and a bolt pistol. But this is not why you take him. You take him because of his Unleashed Demon ability. So once per battle, when you choose to activate him, the demon can take control, Ryan. Yeah. He can take control. And uh, if you do that until the end of the whole game, basically he gets a five up feel no pain. He cannot do shoot actions or overwatch or pick up or mission actions. Can't do any of that. Um, but who cares? And his melee profile gets ceaseless and lethal five in addition to rending. Mm-hmm. Um, and he can fight twice built in without having to pay for the fight twice ploy. So a lot of people, I think in the early days, and I think there's people out there that still think this, say if you're playing on like loot or secure or something, or on Into the Dark with doors, maybe you don't take this model because... He can't do mission actions. Um, He is so good, it doesn't matter. Yeah. He's such a problem for your opponent, and he will, without doing mission actions, win you games just by being a problem. Mm -hmm. He's, like, really hard to kill. He's this impossible beast for some teams to take care of, and he's just awesome. Yeah. Number one thing, um, take the Anointed. He's your best model. One of the best models in the game, I think, in all of Kill Team. Yeah. Yeah. If I pound for to, pound. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think so. Uh, so who are we touching next, Ryan? Who's left? We got... There's a few. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the Butcher. The Butcher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the Butcher, a lot of people have soured on the Butcher. Um, he was initially one of the most popular guys because he's got a big axe and he looks cool. He looks sick. And then people kind of got tired of playing him because he's a little unreliable. Um, but he has a place. So the special stuff about the Butcher, he has a big axe it's four attacks on fours five seven uh he's got reap and he's got uh the vicious blows ability basically if he's the attacker he gets ceaseless if he charged he gets relentless so if he if he's not the attacker if somebody else charges him Mm -hmm. he kind of sucks yeah four attacks on fours he could just whiff yeah um he doesn't even have brutal which you think he would that axe looks brutal forget that that weapon doesn't have brutal it looks like it should but it doesn't um so the more important thing about the reason I would take the Butcher um, is because of his devastating onslaught ability. Basically, um, there's the first bullet, which enemy operatives don't provide combat support. That's whatever. Um, the other thing, the more important thing is you can't move within two inches of him unless yes. you're charging him. So if he's concealed in heavy cover, the guy with the melt gun can't run up to him and shoot him unless they totally get all the way around and break his cover line. So on, like, Into the Dark, you can't always do that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So the things that he's weak against are other melee models, uh, ironically, because he's a big monster melee model. Someone else charging him is really dangerous. Yeah. If he charges, he's he's great. He's going to one-shot, you know, seven wound models probably. Um, but I like him against shooty teams that, that don't want to charge him because he can run up into cover and they can't move within two of them, so shooting him is really hard if he's concealed sometimes. Stuff like Kasserkin. Yes, Kasserkin, Vetguard, Pathfinders. These are the teams where you take him into. Um, be careful of grenades. Grenades are the one thing where he's a little afraid. Yeah, of. because of that indirect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the Butcher, he's kind of a niche pick, unfortunately. He looks so cool. You're not going to take him every game. But once in a great while, uh, you'll you'll bust him out, and he'll be really fun. Um. We've got the Shrive Tail in next, Ryan. Yeah. He's a pretty cool guy. Uh, he, I mean, he, he's got five attacks on threes, three five. He's a melee operative primarily. Um, the special thing about him uh, is he fights first. So good. He's always the first guy to fight. If somebody can charge him, say I'm going to fight, and the, the Shrive Tail and allocates the first dice. Are there any other models in this game that have fights first? There are, but it's, all, it's worded a little different. So there's some... Uh, operatives where they treat themselves as the attacker all the time. Okay. Um, but the Shrive Talon, he starts instead of the attacker. Okay. Even if he's the defender. That So his his wording beats a lot of other models. Mm-hmm. Um, and his 3-5 uh, melee profile with lethal 5 is pretty strong. Um, it's going to be terrible against, like, you know, custodies. And, but, you know, yeah. outside of that... I still even like him against intercessors. Um, I just think that that ability is really good. Um, he also has the horrifying dismemberment ability, where if he kills something, you select an enemy operative within three inches of him and subtract one from their APL. This is awesome against a lot of teams. I love it against Geller Pox especially. Oh yeah, because you can charge like a bug, be within three inches of a Hulk, kill mm-hmm. the bug mm-hmm. in like one shot, and then the Hulk is minus one APL. Yeah, so he's awesome. But he also has the Grizzly Mark ability, which is a two APL thing. Typically, if you're doing this, you want to get it out on the first turn. Um, you basically, it's two APL, and you plant a mark within one inch of him. And enemies within three inches of the mark have to pay an extra APL to do mission actions or pickup actions. And when determining control of an objective within three inches of the mark, treat the total APL of enemy operatives as one less. So if there's two guardsmen... Mm-hmm. Um, so four APL yeah. on an objective, they're actually three APL. So it takes three two APL models to beat him on an objective with the Grizzly Mark. Nice. Um, and it's worth noting that that uh, token does not go away when the Shrive Talon dies. It's there forever. Mm. Pretty cool. Um, we have uh, also the Icon Bearer, who I've kind of grown fond of. He's just your basic warrior, except he has the Icon, so he counts as one higher APL. He's a really great... Uh, like guy to run up with a chain sword and, and do work into like eight wound teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Balefire Acolyte, he's the alpha so good. master here on this team. Um, he's a really good, I think he's the trickiest model, other than the Butcher, I think the Balefire Acolyte is the trickiest model on the team to use properly. Um, he's a very good flex model. He's got a pretty good pair of shooting attacks with the Psychic um, between the, the, bell, uh, the Fire Blast, which is a great blast profile um and the life siphon which underrated uh it's five attacks on threes damage three three um and if you do two or more dice worth of damage you can heal a guy within six inches of the battlefire d3 but a lot of people won't look at it unless they're going for the heal but a lot of the time i found that the the life siphon if you're not getting a like a blast mm-hmm. life siphon is going to be just straight up better it's just it's a really good profile to put damage through um, and uh, he's got the Tainted Bolt Pistol if you're within six inches, which is another really good weapon. It's just a bolt pistol with balanced. Um, and he's got the Fell Dagger for melee, which is five attacks on threes, three, four, and it's got this ability where for every crit that you retain in melee, the target that you're fighting immediately takes two mortal wounds per crit. Um, and you pair that with his uh, Malign Influence Psychic Power. You pick a guy to get Lethal 5, Brutal, and no cover on all their weapons. So his melee gets lethal five and brutal. Uh, if you're willing to dedicate three APL to a charge fight, basically, mm-hmm. you can like one shot models. Yeah, <laughs> you could eat, you could one shot a uh, a seven wound model really easily if you just get two crits. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the the breakpoints get pretty crazy. Uh, I, I really like it. Um, but he's he's a great model to to kind of tech into different situations because he has a kit that can do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I think learning how to use him properly is is not easy, but um, important, I would say. And am I missing anybody? There's the basic There's warrior. There's the basic warrior. You're never going to run that. Um, but yeah, so I think next we're going to talk about their ploys really quickly. Actually, no, before we do the ploys, let's go over the marks. Yeah. The marks of chaos, Ryan. So uh, this team, the whole, the whole like, shtick flavor of, yeah it's that you have the four marks corn nurgle slash and zinch and then there's undivided but probably not going to take that um so corn uh ryan do you want to read the corn rule yeah so each time uh this operative fights in combat in the resolve successful hit step of that combat if you did not retain any crits you can strike with one normal hit as if it were a crit yeah so basically you always get a crit Nice. Uh, that's pretty cool, um, especially the models like the Butcher who have seven crit damage and no lethal five or anything. Um, he likes that a lot. Uh, note that it doesn't retain a crit for you, so like crit abilities don't trigger off of that. You just get the crit damage always. Mm -hmm. um, there is Nurgle, Disgusting Vigor. Uh, each time a shooting attack is made against this operative in the roll defense dice step of that shooting attack, you retain one normal save as a critical save. This is just awesome. Yeah. Just so good. Mm -hmm. um, Slanesh, you get an extra inch of movement. Uh, Zinch, you uh, basically when you're shooting, you can take one of your five ups and turn it into a crit. So that's why I say the Zinch heavy bolter is really good because yeah. you are procking that um that heavy bolter uh p1 pretty frequently and then undivided you get a reroll uh in shooting or melee if your uh, target is within six inches that's that's simple it's fine uh the notable stuff about um legionaries and i think one of their biggest drawbacks is on when you're making your 20 model roster yeah. you can't have corn and Slanesh on the same roster, and you can't have Nurgle and Zinch on the same roster. So basically, you're choosing to pair Corn or Slanesh with Zinch or Nurgle. Mm -hmm. is, is the choice you're making. Um, if you could, if you could mix all the marks together in one beautiful roster, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, so each of these marks uh, and you you allocate the mark to the to the operative when you put them on your roster but uh all the marks have different ploys uh, strategic and um tactical ploys so we'll roll through these quick yeah so corn has uh blood for the blood god and perpetual aggression blood for the blood god basically gives you a uh, and the first time you strike in melee you do one additional damage this is important for models i'd say it's the most important for models that are um, have seven wound crits or seven damage crits because it bumps those seven damage crits into eight damage and now you can one shot eight wound models like Corsairs or Exaction Squad or Kasserkin. Yep. So pretty useful. Um, outside of that, I don't think the break points are like super duper important unless you're fighting elites maybe. Um, there's Perpetual Aggression, which uh, is the main reason to take this corn one's nice. in yeah. my opinion. So basically after you fight in combat with a corn operative, if you are no longer in engagement range, you can basically charge three inches. Um, so it's not exactly a charge. It's a move technically. But if you can finish with an engagement range of an enemy operative, you have to. And it has to be the closest visible enemy operative. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do this even if you've charged or moved during the... Uh, the the action yeah or activation rather so this prox even if you're not the active operative so if somebody else fights you and you kill them you could do that perpetual aggression move three inches um this lets you like ping pong into an yeah. enemy's back line if your opponent isn't expecting this and they're not like planning on this being used uh you know if you're like playing kazarkin and you've got a bunch of guys all within three of each other to uh do like whatever that dash ploy is yeah, uh, you know, just a lot of bodies to, to run into, especially if you're using the butcher with that two inch engagement range, right? Yeah. So technically, the the notable thing about the butcher is that his two inch engagement range only 
counts for when your opponent's moving. So if he's charging, you still have to go within one uh, okay. to, to properly charge. But um, you can have a situation where you win initiative, charge, kill something, perpetual aggression to another guy, kill that guy, perpetual aggression into another guy, and then you're done fighting, but you've just like yeah run down the, the whole side of that board. Um, so I've really enjoyed, uh, at Worlds in particular, I was running the Corn Anointed, um, because he's getting the most value out of, out of corn, I think. Um, he's already really beefy with his five up feel no pain. So you're not missing out on like the other stuff, but he can, and he already has fight twice built in. So you don't have to up, up here where I was going to talk about next, you have hateful assault, which is fight twice if you don't shoot and malicious volleys, which is shoot twice if you don't fight. Um, normally if you want to get the max value out of perpetual aggression, you, want to also pay for hateful assault so that you can fight perpetual aggression, fight something else, perpetual aggression. But um, the anointed, you don't have to pay that CP for, for hateful assault because he can already do it. So um, I had a lot of fun at Worlds having him just be my lone corn operative, uh, just waiting for the moment where I win initiative and get this big giant string of perpetual aggression plays off to just like decimate a whole side of the board. So um, that's the tech there. Uh, it's you can go a whole team of corn operatives with perpetual aggression. It's chaos, so I guess it really fits the theme. Yeah, but um, not my favorite. Uh, but it is scary. It's definitely scary for shooty teams, especially like hordes. Um, next, we're going to talk about the two uh, Nurgle ploys: uh, mutagenic flesh and implacable. So mutagenic flesh, um, basically, you reduce normal damage by one to a minimum of three. Used to be to a minimum of two. Yep. Not anymore. Uh, and then implacable, uh, basically, Nurgle operatives are not injured. They ignore negative modifiers to their APL, and they ignore the penalty to Overwatch. So, very That's good just stuff. good. Yeah, very, yeah. very good stuff. Yeah. A um, couple Slanesh ploys coming up, strat ploys. Uh, Graceful Killer, um, you add one to the crit damage. Characteristic of friendly Slanesh operatives, melee weapons. It's okay. Um, I feel like if you're trying to hit certain breakpoints, that's when you use that. Yeah. The problem is it's like corn, but, you know, you're not auto-critting. You know, so yeah. the, the only difference here is it's each time you crit, you're getting the extra damage rather than the first time you strike getting extra damage. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine. Uh, you know, it definitely has, uh, it has its moments. If you are playing Slanesh, you're going to be using this because the other Slanesh ploy is absolute garbage. Uh, that is Delicious Agony. Basically, I'm going to lay out why this is so bad. It's one of the worst ploys in the game. <laughs> um, whenever you, each time you fight with Slanesh Operative, when you would resolve your first successful hit, if the target is injured, you can resolve two hits instead. So this is when you resolve the first hit. Yeah. And the target has to be injured. They have to already be injured. There's a laundry list of like prerequisites for At this to trigger. Most of your team is already killing a guy that they're hitting if they're already injured. Yeah. So like, okay, the big 18 wound models like Custodes. Oh, wait, they can't be injured. Oh, look at that. Custodes <laughs> can't be injured. So this literally like, okay, like an intercessor. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're down to six wounds and they're injured. Uh, and you're using, you know, a weapon that, uh, maybe you're hitting with fists and then you can double hit with fists and kill them or like a chain sword maybe. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most useful moment to use this and it's so niche. Uh, you're probably already winning that combat anyway. Yeah. Um, don't ever spend command points on this. <laughs> maybe if you're playing as Geller Pox and they've got like eight wounds left, like the Hulks, that's all I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wouldn't. Uh, and then you have the Zinch ploys, uh, protected by fate. Uh, basically, in the roll defense dice step, if you get a crit save, you can turn a fail into a normal. I don't really love this because you're relying on rolling a crit on three dice. Yeah. It just feels weird to me. Um, and then there's the real reason to take Zinch, which is Etheric Ward. Uh, your Zinch guys get a four-up invuln. That seems like yes. it would be very good into a certain meta that has developed recently. Yeah, the current meta. Yes, yeah. Shitty hordes. So, yeah, Zinch 4-up in Mulm. That's um, 
why you take Zinch, I think. Gotcha. Uh, and then each one of these has a single tactical ploy. Corn uh, has unending bloodshed. Basically, if you die in melee, you can make another attack. You get one attack dice. And if you hit, you can strike with it. And then you remove both guys. Um, it's I, fine. Yeah. Um, it's like you're injured, so you're just coin flipping. And you just spent a CP. Like maybe you can spend another CP to attack reroll if you fail. But um, I don't know. It's okay. Uh, if it will if kill the, something. If the butcher was charged in this instance and you're not even coin flipping, right? Because yeah, you need five, a five. Need yeah. A five yeah. I mean, it's best on like an anointed where he's got ceaseless or something or like a leader gotcha. who's on twos into threes when he's injured. Yeah. Uh, there's mutability and change, which is the other reason to take Zinch. Um, use it when you activate a Zinch operative. Add one to its APL. This is awesome. That's on, so um, good. Just being able to get four APL when you need it. Yeah. It's especially terrifying on Into the Dark because you can have a Balefire Zinch move, dash, open a door, shoot. Ooh. Players have lost games uh, <laughs> just because of that. They just didn't okay. realize that play could happen. It's and kind of like the um, the Hyrotech Circle yeah. type situation going yeah, on with the, uh, the Alpha Strike. Terrifying Alpha Strike on Into the Dark. Um, very good. Uh, there's Malignant Aura for Nurgle. Uh, basically, pop it on a Nurgle guy, and for the rest of the turn, any enemy operators within three inches of that Nurgle guy uh, have one less defense characteristic. So I love using this with a Meltagun. Oh, yeah. Moving within three, yeah. and they get zero defense dice. AP2, baby. And you just die. Because <laughs> um, there are certain <laughs> operatives that will not die for sure, even if you, like, in, like an Orc Knob with just a scratch. Um, if you're shooting him with a plasma that's overcharged, four hits doesn't even confirm the kill. Yeah, you need. He might live. That's the minimum requirement yeah. is four hits. Is four, four hits doesn't confirm it because he can save the one that he has oh, yeah. and just a scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you do in that situation? You pop Malignant Aura and you say, you don't even get defense dice. Here's 20 damage. Die. Just to scratch your way out of that one. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's that's really good. Uh, I love use, I've done it on an Ogren, a blooded Ogren, many a times. It's my favorite guy to do it to. He just melts. It's great. Um, and then there's Sickening Captivation, which is a good Slanesh tactical ploy. Basically, um, use it during a Slanesh guy's activation. Pick an enemy within three invisible. Subtract one from his APL. I like this against Geller Pox with the Shrive Talon. You can, you yeah. can do that to two hulks, and you just ruin the Geller Pox player's day. Yeah. Um, pretty good. Nice. And, yeah. <laughs> There's one other tactical ploy. It's Veterans of the Long War. Any Legionary guy can do it regardless of their mark. Basically, if you are fighting or shooting and you do no damage at the end of it, you can pay one CP and restart the attack. Um, if it's melee, you restart the whole fight. If it's shooting, you just re-roll the dice. Basically, It's not a re-roll. You just start over. It's a new attack. Gotcha. Um, sometimes if like I'm in melee, say I charge a guardsman. Yeah. And I've got five attacks, and the Guardsman has three attacks. And I roll one hit. Yeah. The Guardsman rolls one hit. Yeah. I just parry and then pay one. And then it'll just do it all over again. So, like, you're – it's like insurance, kind of. You're you're (laughs) paying one CP for, like, a a bunch of command rerolls when you think about it. Yeah, because, like, it's really tempting sometimes when you roll really bad to be like, oh, I'm going to spend three CP on a bunch of command point rerolls. With Legionnaires, don't do that. Unless, like, you're in danger mode and your opponent got a bunch of hits and you're going to die. Yeah. Um, do Veterans of the Long War. It's going to save your butt. Uh, it's like a whiff. Nice. Uh, save. All right. So we've gone over the ploys. We're going to really quick go over the equipment and then talk about, like, actual strategy. Um, this is pretty quick, honestly. Mm-hmm. You have aggression stimulants. It's three equipment points. If you charge, uh, then you get a reroll in melee. Uh, this is not really worth it. I've taken it zero times in a year. Just don't do it. All the models that would need rerolls uh, already have them. Uh, yeah, so ignore that. Great. Frag grenade, <laughs> you can take it against hordes. Um, I don't really love frag grenades. You have a lot of blast on the team already. Yeah, so one. like with the frag grenade, you have three you have three sources of blast, including the frag grenade, because you've got the frag. the missile launcher, you've got the balefire blast, yeah. power, and then this. Are there any other uh, sources of blast on this team? No. Okay. So you can have three sources of blast, which is nice. Um, against a big horde, maybe. 
you could do this. Mm. I, I don't really usually take frag grenades. I'm not a big fan. Oh, yeah. Um, next up is the crack grenade, which is always very tempting. I love the crack grenade. Uh, specifically, I will put it on the Balefire Acolyte so that he can cast Malign Influence on himself. And then he has a crack grenade with a lethal five and no cover. Yeah. Which is just awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's just so cool. Um, it's good. Uh, warded Armor. Uh, you're going to want to take three of these. Uh, just well, kidding. it says you can only take <laughs> one, Shane. Uh, if only. No, it's three equipment points, and you get a two-up save until you take damage. Uh, just don't take it. It's not worth it. Nope. It's really bad. Uh, you've got the suspenser system. Every time you take a heavy gunner, you are going to take a suspenser system. Yeah, just staple it. Yeah, it's really good. You've got malign scripture for two equipment points. You give it to the balefire, and uh, he can do two psychic powers during his activation don't take this Uh oh because you can still so the thing about the bale fire is if you do a second psychic power um you can do mortal wounds to yourself if you don't like okay yeah uh this is bad just don't take it because you yeah just don't don't take the malign scripture don't take it no. uh all right the only use case is if you want to cast malign influence and shoot one of your psychic weapons. Right? Yeah. Because um, you can't shoot both the psychic weapons. I just don't. Yeah, you just don't take it. Uh, there's tainted rounds for three equipment points. This is uh, basically you, you pick a bolt weapon, a bolt gun, a bolt pistol, or a tainted bolt pistol, and you add one to both damage characteristics, so it becomes four or five damage. This is pretty cool on paper. I'm sure if, like... I don't know. I've heard people say, like, you go, like, a Zinchi shooty team and with, like, an Icon bolt gun and take this. Um, the only time I've found myself wanting to take this is against, like, Chaos Cult and Geller Pox, teams where I actually don't want to really melee them that much and I want to lean heavily into shooting. Then I'll take the bolt gun Icon bearer and give him Tainted Rounds to just have another source of double shooting, like, high damage potential. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty niche. And then we've got the Grizzly Trophy. This is the best one, right? This is the one you're going to take every single game. Um, I like to put it on the Anointed, just to make him unkillable. Basically, you you slap it on a guy. Uh, you can only take one, unfortunately. Um, and while he's visible to within three inches of an enemy operative, you subtract one from the attacks characteristic of ranged and melee weapons that the enemy has. So a Anointed with five up feel no pain and Nurgle um, in cover... The opponent has to move within two of them to shoot him, so they're they're getting one less dice. He has a five up feel no pain. He's reducing normal damage by one. He gets a free crit defense save. Um, I, it's like the tankiest thing in the game, maybe. Um, so there's arguments to taking the Grizzly Trophy on like the Shrive Talent against melee teams, maybe. I don't hate it. Um, I think if you're on Into the Dark. Uh, taking a Grizzly Trophy on a Butcher is actually quite good because you can't move within two of them to shoot him, but on Into the Dark, you need to... Uh, um, e indirect only happens within three inches. The only weakness the Butcher has really on Into the Dark, if he's in cover, concealed, is a grenade three inches away. Um, and I've played games where I wish I gave the Grizzly Trophy to the Butcher mm. just so that like it kind of like eliminates all the threats to him. Right. Um but uh, naturally, though, you're going to take it a lot of the time on the Anointed. Mm -hmm. um, the last equipment is Malefic Blade. Two equipment points. It's another melee weapon you get. It's five attacks on threes, three, five. Uh, I take this a lot. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times, my choices are I'll go a Grizzly Trophy. If I have a Heavy Gunner, I'll take a Suspenser System. That's six of my points, and then I have four left. And at that point, I'm choosing between what's more important to me, a Crack Grenade or two Malefic Blades to go on my two Gunners. Um, if you aren't taking a heavy gunner, then you go Grizzly Trophy, Crack Grenade, and still probably two Malefic Blades. Um, Malefic Blades and the Gunners make a lot of sense. Yeah. Because uh, it gives them a better melee profile. Uh, also, huge shout to the Malefic Blade on the Butcher. So we mentioned earlier that the Butcher yes. sucks if he gets charged because his weapon is four, four up. Yeah, four attacks on fours. If he gets charged and he has a Malefic Blade, he's got a decent profile that you can rely on getting hits and maybe parrying, or even better, if you roll well, uh, maybe you'll kill something with a Malefic Blade. Mm -hmm. So, love that. It, it it makes your gunners, like, actual, like, flex threats. Um, I don't like to do this, but I've heard people take, uh, you know, corn gunners 
and then they can charge with the Malefic Blade, get an auto five damage crit, maybe six damage crit if they paid for it, kill something, and then they shoot a Melta Gun or something or a mm-hmm. Plasma. And that's a pretty awesome flex profile there. But um, yeah, so that's all the stuff. We just went over pretty much all the stuff other than the Tac Ops, the Faction Tac Ops, not very good. Um, I think I forgot to highlight one thing in the leaders. Um, the leader and the Icon Bearer. Oh, yes. If, they're, uh, if the leader is alive or the Icon Bearer, you can have a free plo- uh, strategic ploy once in, uh, in each strategic phase of the mark affiliated with that operative. So if you have a Nurgle leader, you can take Mutagenic or Implacable for free in the strategic phase if that leader's alive. Nice. Um, and one of the benefits to having the Icon is if your leader dies, you can still get a free ploy. Yeah. If, if he's alive. Yeah. Um, Which, I mean, your aspiring champion, like, does die in a lot of your games. He's a very aggressive model. Because he's in there. He's mixing it up. He's probably going to kill a lot of stuff on turn two. Yeah. And if maybe he'll live on turn two and kill something on turn three. But by the end of turn three, he's, he's usually He's usually done. done. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of your job to make sure he's done enough before he dies. Uh, all right. So... The big debate, Ryan, is what marks of chaos do you choose? Um, yeah. So I want to talk about, uh, first of all, I think the main um, thing for me when I'm picking marks is I look at Nurgle and Zinch as like the core structure of my team. It's very, I, I personally competitively wouldn't recommend going a full corn build or a full Slanesh build. But what I would recommend is a full Nurgle or full Zinch with what I would describe as like a tech piece for Corn or a tech piece for Slanesh. Got you. To like fill in for a specific job. Um, a really common one, for instance, is I'll take a Nurgle list uh, to a tournament and I'll say in a, in a game against Gellerpox, I'll have five Nurgle guys, but then I'll take a Slanesh Shrive Talon. And he'll be my one non-Nurgle guy because he has a very specific benefit from taking the Slanesh mark, um, like those plays I was talking about earlier where you can, like, double stun a couple of hulks. Yeah. Um, at Worlds, what I was doing was taking a Nurgle list, and against certain teams, I take a Corn Anointed um, because with the 5 of Feel No Pain and the Grizzly Trophy, the theory being he can be tanky without Nurgle. Um, and that was largely the case. I still find myself missing Nurgle occasionally. Um, at Worlds, there were really good players that were really, really cautious about um, perpetual aggression and letting me get those plays off. But So even though I wasn't getting the perpetual aggression plays off, though, they were still respecting it, and therefore they were keeping their models further back than even they wanted to just to prevent me from being able to do that. So it, it you know, it's a threat, even if it's not going off. Um, so as far as what marks you should take on your roster right now, so I want this to be something where people can look back on this guide after, you know, who knows, six months from now. Yeah. We've had a couple more data slates. The game could look totally different. Obviously, right now at the time of release, it's kind of a shooty meta horde. Every team seems to be good against elites. Um, Kasserkin is ridiculous against us. Vetguard's really good. These teams with a lot of high armor-piercing weapons. So what you're going to see very commonly right now is people saying, oh, take Zinch. Um, for the past year, I've been running Nurgle on my uh, tournament rosters. And I would be kind of inclined to take Nurgle even still in this meta. Um, so it's a tough thing because I think Nurgle, you know, you're you're kind of more reliable all the time. Um, yeah. And you're going to take more damage on average than if you're taking Zinch. Um but the thing about it is most of the time you're still going to live, even if it's with a few wounds with Nurgle, and because of implacable ignoring injury, Yeah, your models are still very, very efficient, even if they're you know on their last leg. And I really value that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's the same reason that everybody was taking um, uh, not methodical, whatever the, uh, the intercession chapter tactic was that just allowed you to ignore oh it was like, methodical oh it was methodical it okay now, yeah that yeah was the thought. that's the reason why you know yeah we were taking that so much when we were running intercession right 100 percent. and so I, I guess i what i would highlight is um zinch the thing is yes your your odds are are higher of surviving like a plasma mm-hmm. uh, it's but i think 
plasma, it doesn't bother me too much with Nurgle. I think most of the time, unless they're rolling really, really well and you're you're failing your one save, um, you're going to still live with Nurgle. Um, a lot of people talk about the breakpoints with Nurgle. Uh, mutagenic Flesh um, it brings the five damage normal on a plasma down to four. And, oh, well, you know, two normals plasma is 10 damage. That's not killing you. Uh, neither is eight damage after mutagenic. But the thing is, leaves you on four health. Mutagenic reduces to a minimum of three. So a lot of the time, having four health is still going to be the difference later in living or dying a little bit. Um, Zinch, on the other hand, gets the four up invulns. They're always, uh, I'd say, against a, a Melta. Zinch is amazing. Yeah. Um, Nurgle, I don't expect to live against a Melta if it's, you know, ballistic skill three. Um, so I did a little fun, cool, interesting uh, Nurgle Zinch math just to like highlight oh, sure. what's better uh, against what. So um, let's talk about a crack grenade. Very okay. common. Most teams have a crack grenade. Yeah. A crack grenade against uh, Nurgle with mutagenic flush on, because I'm going to assume mutagenic flush is always on with Nurgle because you get it for free if you want. Um, the odds of dying to a crack grenade if you have uh, mutagenic flush online is 3.3%. Very, very low it's odds It's incredibly of low, yeah. Um, that's without cover. If you're in cover, it's less than 1%. Okay. 0.37%. <laughs> um, so uh, plasma overcharged against Nurgle, another okay. very common weapon. Um, if you're not in cover, 33% chance of death. So your odds are good. If you're in cover, 20% chance of death. So you're... Unlikely to die, basically, yeah. with, with Nurgle against overcharged plasma. Um, a Melta, uh, assuming three-up ballistic skill Melta against Nurgle with mutagenic flesh, it's basically a coin flip, whether it's about a 50-50. It's close to that. Okay. Um, if you are in cover, 42% chance you die. So you're likely to live, you're technically likely to live, but the uh, the situations where you're not in cover, getting shot with a Melta gun, not very common. Six yeah. Inch range, they're probably able to get within two. Um, so yeah, uh, let's talk about, but dynamite. still, I mean, 50, 50 on a Melta, yeah. like I, th that's good. Yeah, it is good. It, it is comparatively. Good <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about dynamite or commando dynamite. Oh, okay. And let's say they have Daka 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 on. So they're, they, if they get a crit, they're turning a fail into a normal. Um, so the best case scenario for an orc shooting you with okay. dynamite. Uh, Nurgle, it's a 27% chance of dying. So really low. Um, and that's without cover. If you're in cover, 15% chance of death. So really, really good. Um, pretty, you know, overall, Nurgle's letting you live most of the time. A Melta is probably the scariest thing you can imagine coming at you. Yeah. So with Zinch, uh, we're going to go back. Um, a crack grenade against Zinch is about a, uh, assuming you have the four up invuln online all yep. the time, yep. about a 15% death chance. Okay, so, so considerably is, higher. It's much worse against a crack grenade than Nurgle. Still not likely to kill you, yeah. but it'll happen, whereas with Nurgle, it's almost never going to happen. Um, overcharge Plasma. So I said earlier, uh, with cover, uh, without cover is 33% death chance for Nurgle. For Zinch, it's only an 18% death chance. So that's when it starts to get better. And Zinch with cover, only 5% chance of dying to an overcharged Plasma compared to the 20% with Nurgle. So for both, though, you like the odds of living. Yeah. Now, the Melta is where the Zinch starts to get quite a bit better. No cover, 42% chance of surviving. Um, or, sorry, 42% chance of death uh, without cover. Okay. Um, with cover, 28% chance you survive a Melta with Zinch for up invuln. So that's really good. Um, uh, did I say 20% chance of death? Or you, said, you said 28% chance of survival. Sorry. 28% 20, 20 chance of dying. Got you. Okay. Um, and then Dynamite, Zinch has a, uh, it's basically, it's very similar. It's 27% chance of death without cover on Zinch against the Dynamite Daka Daka. 15% chance uh, with cover of, of death. So basically this, for the for the Dynamite, it's, it's the math is almost identical, but the average damage taken is a little higher with Zinch. I didn't factor in average damage taken. For most of these, Nurgle has a higher average damage taken. Okay. Um, just because, you know, you, you're going to have less defense dice. Yeah. Um, but like I said earlier, um, your uh, 
your models are doing more with less wounds on Nurgle. So that's why I lean towards it. Like basically the, the math that we just went over says, unless you're getting shot by a Melta, you're still probably going to live with Nurgle and your models are going to be more useful when they're on low health. Got you. So this is why I still lean towards um, Nurgle. Although I'd, at this point in the meta, I don't blame anybody for going Zinch. Yeah. Um, my opinion of it ultimately, and I, I think this is um, my final thought on the Nurgle versus Zinch debate, is there are going to be metas like now where Zinch is better. But in my opinion, any meta where Zinch is the best choice, I think Legionaries is a worse team. If oh, that makes okay. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Nur Nurgle's probably not as good right now. But in a world where Nurgle is the best choice, they're like an A tier team. I think right now they're B or C tier, with Zinch being the, the safest, best choice. Um, yeah. And the other thing to consider is Nurgle helps against melee, Zinch does not. So, if there's ever a melee meta, I think that's more reason to go Nurgle. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I like to talk about turn one a lot. Yeah. Turn one. Turn is, one's important. Turn one is very important. I think that's the hardest part about learning a new team is figuring out what to do on turn one because you lose a lot of games right out the gate and uh, you're forced to like play through turns two through four just like why did I do everything I did? Yeah. Um, and I think uh, elite. this is more of an elite thing rather than a legionary thing. But um, the key thing is safety is the priority. Um very passive safety um, mm -hmm. you are going to uh basically accept the fact in a lot of matchups that you're only going for two primary points on turn one um anything more than that and you're usually going to be putting your models in danger um and you don't want to do that i think there's like kind of almost like a timer when you're playing elites where you can um if you go into turn three and you still have like five guys left the game's going to be so hard for your opponent. And if you go into turn yeah. two, in the same kind of respect, if you go into turn two and you've lost nothing, um, that's really good. But if you go into turn two and you've lost even one model, the game's a lot harder for you. Um, I think the amount of games where you lose one of your six guys on turn one and then go on to win is uh, not happening super often. Okay. So this means you're going to go full conceal a lot of the time. You're not even going to bot. I think you can uh have a engaged plasma for instance if you are um if there's like a total visibility blocking piece of terrain in your deployment zone yeah um just to like keep them honest a little bit yeah because you're three apl because you can like pop up on something shoot and then duck yeah. back down and, and a lot of the time what that guy actually does for me is he just is kind of a threat for about five activations and then i go and i have him like loot my back point and then yeah. run back out of visibility. Yeah. And then it's, all right, there's no more, you know, you can yeah. do it. It's want. over. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you keep that threat open. Um, but uh, typically, yeah. I mean, and if you, you can go all conceal, if you're pretty confident that you're, you're going to be okay taking infiltrate in the scouting, um, that's fine. Uh, but your, your goal on turn one with legionaries against any team with shooting for the most part is to play pretty, um, passively and get your two primary points go down two four turn one and then kind of claw your way back as the game goes on set your set your models up like the anointed and conceal move him up into like a heavy piece of terrain closer to the middle of the board so that way turn two he has charges um do similar stuff with your aspiring champion i didn't talk about this earlier but 13 wounds with a nurgle aspiring champion nothing's one shotting him no it's like so rare even the Melta, because the breakpoints become really bad against him because he has 13 wounds. Um, uh, aspiring Champion or Chosen, uh, same deal, is not dying to a lot of stuff. Uh, so just move those concealed melee models up the board. Keep the ranged guys kind of behind them as, like, counter punches because um, they can always flex into, like, charging and fighting with a Malefic Blade, too, if they need to. Um now, this strategy changes if you're playing against a melee horde like Geller Pox, Felgors, or Chaos Cults, um, because then you go all engage. You don't really respect the, the shooting on the other side. Yeah. Uh, you go full engage, and you just try to pick off as many things as you can, play really aggressive. And then there's the other thing, which is regardless of if it's a melee horde or a shooty horde, 
you look at the deployment zones and you determine, can I alpha strike <laughs> with the with the battle fire? Yeah, with the uh, um, pizza deployment. Yeah, and the, uh, really easier on diagonal deployments, especially some boards you're going to be at at a tournament, and they're just going to have pretty open spots on the deployment. Yeah, they um, are. And speaking from experience, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like you, you, if if that's the case, you're going to put your battle fire in your last deployment group, drop him down engaged, and um, recon dash him with scouting. Mm -hmm. And you can always leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room, like. Maybe put him in a spot where if you're going to be able to get that turn one first activation and get that blast off, then you take initiative and you dash him forward with the recon dash. But say, you know, your opponent took infiltrate. They saw what you're doing. They're going to go first and, like, mess you up. Um, put your bell fire in a spot where the recon dash, he could just dash behind a building. So there's, like, a contingency plan. Yeah. Um, so... You know, uh, try to identify that in deployment when you're looking at the board. Um, obviously, it's easier if you're an attacker because you're going to, there's more options where you can win that initiative reliably. But yeah, those are the things to look out for. Um, against, uh, you know, mid sized teams, I think mid sized teams are, are weird and tricky. Stuff like Commandos, uh, Elucidian Star Striders, um, it's getting rid of key models, I think is, is what yeah. I've noticed a lot. Um, if you're playing against Star Striders, for instance, and you get rid of their assassin, um, the game gets a lot easier. Oh, yeah. If you're playing against orcs and the rocket goes away and you kill the knob on turn two, the game gets a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, but again, these are teams where you're playing really passive in the early game and, and, and not letting them get chances on you. And if they are getting chances on you, it's not a good chance. Like it's, they're, okay, they can take a shot at your... Uh, anointed who, who has a five up feel no pain and has a grizzly trophy um i've won a lot of games because my opponent wins initiative on turn two the only shot they have is the anointed and they do what they do in any other game and they say oh i'm gonna take initiative and shoot the guy that i can shoot with the best gun that i have and then it falls flat and then i Great. just start trading up Great, love um, that <laughs> so that's how you're gonna win a lot of games just just through doing that like dangling that piece forward um uh, yeah, and it's that's really strong. Cool. Um, against other elites, you know, you just hit, you take a Melta, you take a plasma pistol, um, and you just are better at killing them than they are killing you. Yes. Uh, I think legionnaires are really good into elite teams. Um, the other elite. Yeah, teams, you guys are so excited for the intercession matchup yeah. every time you uh, go in. It's. I don't know if I've ever come close to losing to intercession with. <laughs> legionaries if i'm being honest i thought we played one game yeah i think that is actually the closest i've ever come to losing yeah. to intercession yeah um and like when you just look at phobos and you look at intercession intercession has one ap2 weapon and it's yep. hitting on threes um phobos has i think no ap2 um and they've got a lot of low damage guns like it's like literally just all three four yeah so they they don't have ways to one shot you. No. But you have the anointed can charge the anointed can charge two Marines and kill them both. Um the aspiring champ can one shot a Marine with the plasma pistol. The Melta can one shot a Marine. Um the plasma gun can one shot a Marine, whatever you decide to take. Um that's a good matchup for, you know, the um the uh god i'm forgetting the mal malignant aura the zero defense dice play with the melter the plasma yeah just to pick up a model just get it out of there um don't worry about armor saves so yeah uh really good into elites in the mid-sized teams it's passive play and in and, and really good targeting i think is the most important thing and against hordes it's be really passive again and uh just try to trade up you know look for two for ones um, dangle out the anointed, let them, you know, think they can kill it. And when they can't, you, uh, you strike back. Nice. You strike hard, strike fast. Oh uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I, I think that's just like the general gist of how I like to approach the different types of teams. Um, there's also, uh, into the dark and open board. And I guess beta decima coming up, but honestly, I, I haven't thought much about beta decima and I don't think it's going to be really common at tournaments. It definitely won't be because it's so new. Yeah, it's really um, new. Potentially, like, in the fall mm -hmm. maybe is when you would start seeing more of it. But I would expect maybe, like, a few boards to be at tournaments. Yeah, maybe. 
I looking at the rules for beta decima, there's nothing about legionnaires that say that say to me that that team is good on beta decima. Um, they they don't have like crazy mobility stuff. Like they're not auto passing jump tests or anything. They don't fly. Um, they don't have anything that like takes away like obscurity. Yeah, they can't ignore you know? obscurity. I mean, they do have the benefit of like there's not a lot of them, so it's really easy to deploy on just about any board. That's another thing with elites is you can deploy like really safely all the time. Yeah. You don't have to worry about like, oh, I'm running out of room in my deployment zone. Where am I going to put my guys? Uh, so it's nice not worrying about that. And I think that will translate to beta decima, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, on Into the Dark, they are amazing. They're one of the best Into the Dark teams. In oh, the yeah. Um, the general strategies on Into the Dark that I like to uh, put down are... Um, I've mentioned earlier the aspiring champion against a closed door on turn one um, is for APL essentially, and you treat him that way because he's going to open the door, kill something, and then you know kill something else, and then do a mission action on top mm -hmm. of all that. So, um, and your opponents will frequently forget that your aspiring champion can do a free thing if he kills somebody, and you'll win games off of that. Um, because, you know, they, they see a guy behind a closed door. They're like, well, he can open, charge, fight one guy, and then he's done. Yeah. But he can do more than that. Yep. Um, on open board, though, it's like I said, it's it's a lot more passive. Um, you can't quite... Uh, the, the other great thing, especially crit ops, looking at open board and looking at Into the Dark, is you'll notice a lot of the Into the Dark boards, you can very reliably get three primary. Um, that's awesome for Legionnaires. Because if you get three primary on turn one, then your opponent can't, like, hope to just score you out, you know, and, and try and, like, ride off of the primary game and the scoring game. They actually have to, like, they see the 3-3, three, three and it's like, oh, I actually have to kill these models now. And that's when it starts to get really difficult for the opponent into, um, into Legionnaires. And that does apply on some open board layouts. Uh, at Nova, I played against um, a commando at, in one of the games on loot, and I noticed that, like, one of the objectives that was, like... Because on most of the open boards for crit ops, you have two f more free objectives. Um, and then there's, like, two that are more central and two on your opponent's side. And I noticed that if I just first activation grabbed one of the central ones closer to me, then I'm guaranteed to get my two. My yeah. I'm going to take that. And then I go 3-3 three, three on turn one. And it was far enough away that the commando couldn't punish me. Um and I got the 3-3 three, three on turn one, and the player was like, like, you could see, like, the, the wheels turning. Yeah. Like, oh, wait, I have to actually kill them. Yeah. Like, I have to play a real game. I can't just outscore this team and, like, you know, try to, like, eke out a win. You got to stand and bang. Yeah, which no team stands and bangs better than Legionaries, in my opinion. Um, maybe, like, Geller Pox, but even... That's just because they're so big. Yeah, they're so big. <laughs> there's so many wounds. Um, yeah, no, I think Legionaries probably do it even better um so yeah i mean if you can get a 3-3 three, three safely like that's kind of like a skill in playing this team is identifying when it's safe to get a 3-3 three, three. on into that arc it's really obvious because you're gonna have three objectives on your side they're gonna have three objectives on their side there's closed doors and walls between you they probably can't stop you from getting three which uh which is one of the reasons i love that so much yeah the only other thing really you're trying to set up on into that arc is that anointed with the grizzly trophy a lot of the time He's going to run up onto a door. Somebody else is going to open it for him, and he's just going to stand there on demon mode. They they can't get him unless they move within two. So they're hitting the grizzly trophy. He's got to feel no pain. Um, and, and if you run him up onto a door where next turn he's running it at the opponent, like out of one of their objectives, mm -hmm. uh, that's a really tough just like – it's not even a puzzle really. It's just like a hammer. Like, you just put it there and you say deal with it, and, like, yeah. the other team just can't deal with it, really. Mm -hmm. They just need to, like, space really, really well and avoid getting punished by it, which they can't always. Um, yeah, I mean, the only other problem in Into the Dark is if you play on Conduit, the first Into the Dark mission, where you get one objective, your opponent gets one objective, uh, and there's just four rooms in the middle. Yeah. That is garbage for elites. You just have to, like, against a lot of teams, you have to get one primary. Yeah. And that's it. That's bad. And that's horrible. Yeah. Um, then you're really clawing back. But uh, I've done that before and come back. So it's not impossible, but it's really hard. It's it's hard going down 2-4. Going down 1-4 is like, 
yeah, I hate, I think that yeah. mission shouldn't even be competitive, but that's a, another day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of like decisions that you have to make with legionaries. And a lot of it, I think comes down to like identifying the points on the board where you put your threat pieces on turn one. Um, and navigating whether or not you're going to be able to get three victory points or two victory points on turn one. You're never going to get four, so don't even try it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe against Votan. I've, I've, I think there's an argument to be made that against, like, a really slow team like Votan, where you don't really want to kill them, but they're slow and they suck at primary two, maybe them you can go for. That's interesting, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. It's Most of the time you're, you're just looking to uh, to stay safe, get a couple points, and then come back into the game mm-hmm. um the common attack ops you're going to take rob and ransack every game uh eliminate guards route are the three and if you're playing against an elite team i think you can go headhunter or assassinate target in place of uh route um i still would take rob and ransack pretty much always against anybody um eliminate guards it's a little tougher against eliminate gu- yeah against like uh three apl yeah. teams that one i personally find pretty difficult to score sometimes yeah um but yeah because like like you say with elite team like the three apl like they can if it's loot they can loot the objective and then move off it exactly you even have a choice exactly so there yeah i think you can go assassinate target headhunter um and just take their leader out i love two. that combo against elites yeah uh because they you know assassinate target they can't leave a guy back and do nothing. If they exactly. do that, you're going to win the game. Like yeah. You may not max tech ops, but you're going to win the game because they're just sitting back with a guy. Yep. Um, so th- that's kind of the approach there. At Worlds, every game I took route, Robin Rance, I eliminate guards, and I would probably do that against any non-elite team, I think. Okay. Um, maybe Void Dancers, you can go headhunter in place of eliminate guards. Yeah. Just because they're 3 APL. Yeah. Uh, and their leader is usually pretty aggressive. So, yeah, um, I don't know. It's it's kind of a pretty straightforward approach, though, with TAC Ops. I generally avoid security. Um, yeah, uh, I think the thing with security, I'll just say this now, is if you have a good faction TAC Op, if you have one good faction TAC Op, I think security is good. I think you can always find two of those six security TAC Ops that will pair well with your faction TAC Op. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you don't have a faction TAC Op, having three security tech ops that actually work with your game plan is like kind of rare um unless you're like a team with a bunch of bodies yeah um so with elites and legionnaire in particular just don't ever take it um but yeah i mean i I think that's kind of like the main strategy that comes into play i'm trying to think if there's anything else that i have thought hard about over the past year with um with legionaries um you're gonna struggle to to choose between whether you want a heavy gunner or an icon bearer a lot of the time um into uh the shooty hordes like kasserkin pathfinders and vet guard uh you'll take the butcher there and you'll not take a heavy gunner because you don't want to be shooting them too often because if you're shooting them, they might be able to shoot you back. That's their game, yeah. yeah. You don't want to play their game. Um, you probably still will take a regular gunner with a malefic play because he, against those seven wound and eight wound teams, he can actually charge, kill, shoot something. Yeah. Um, and that's a, usually a pretty good strategy. Um, and the icon comes out. I, I typically, like I said, if I'm against Chaos Cultists or Gallery Pox, I'll probably take an icon bolt gun with tainted rounds. Um, but against, say, um, Corsairs maybe, or uh, you could make the argument for Kasserkin as well. You could take a Chainsword Icon. Um, four damage normal means you're killing eight wound models in two hits, so that's a pretty nice break point. It's good to have the four APL guy just running onto a center point and, like, making it really hard to budge. Um, and it's always nice to have the extra source of the free play. So, um a lot of the time, I think in general, with as far as spending command points, you'll use mutagenic. Say you're you're playing Zinch, you'll use the four up invuln on turn one for free. If you're playing Nurgle, you'll take mutagenic for free on turn one, and then on turn two, you'll use that one for free again. Maybe with Nurgle, you'll use Implacable. 
Um, with Zinch, I don't think you'll spend for the other one. But uh, you'll find that n Legionnaires have a lot of CP to, to go around. So you can command point reroll kind of liberally with this team if it's a situation where it's like, oh, I need one more hit, and that'll actually get the kill. But if it's a total whiff, you got veterans of the long war. Gotcha. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to, to ask about as far as um, Legionary stuff? Um, because I'd hate myself gosh. if I forgot something, and I remember in like a week. I don't know. I think we've we've delved pretty deep. Yeah. And pretty greedily. Pretty greedily. Yeah. With um, uh, with this deep dive. Yeah. I think we've covered, gosh, like everything. Um, uh, I guess I could talk a little bit about specific factions that are tough. That's what I was going to suggest, actually. I guess we can start with, like, Kasserkin, since they're the talk of the town. Yeah, Kasserkin is probably the best um, elite killer in the game. Um, I think the, the teams that are going to give you the biggest troubles are Kasserkin. They have a lot of AP. Yeah. Um, and they can just, like, dump their elite points into murdering you. Um, Hearthkin, they have a ton of AP. They have more AP than any team in the game. And when you kill them, uh, they you get grudge tokens. Yep. Um, and there's less of you, so stacking grudge tokens on your guys is, like, really easy for them. Um, so they can just wipe your models pretty effortlessly, especially into the late game. Um, Blooded. It's just they have like seven out of their twelve to fourteen models can kill elites. That's great. That's awesome. Um, and they can outactivate you, wait you out. In general, I think that teams with a lot of activations and a lot of um, high AP weapons. Uh, Vetguard. I played against Vetguard at Worlds um, against uh, Le uh, Leander Garrett, mm -hmm. uh, and it was open board Octarius Vetguard. And Ooh. that was just hopeless. It, fe it felt, like, impossible. Like, with a really good player running that card like Leander, it almost felt like there. it's like, this is the ceiling for elites. It's like, this is really tough. I talked about this in a past pod. That's, like, really horrible scenario. Um, but I think, uh, like I said, I think they're awesome into other elites. Yeah. Um, I think they are... I don't want to say that they're good against commandos, but they're better than most any team against commandos okay um so uh that's worth noting um yeah i mean uh the the matchups can be can be pretty brutal and i think in general when you're playing an elite team and this won't matter for 99 percent of the games that anybody plays but if you're playing against a really good player at a tournament like the top level player running a horde they can force you into situations and i encountered this at worlds against inquisition in particular twice where they're playing so safe and they're waiting me out and my only way in is to run a guy up into a spot where i know he's going to get shot and then i have to hope that he lives and then i have to hope that i win initiative because if i don't he's going to shoot me again and then if i win initiative then i then i just destroy them but if i don't then it's you know the, the player with more activations can really put you in a bad position. Um, and, and you kind of just have to hope you live. And w with Zinch, I don't like relying on making that many four-ups. Yeah, that's a thing, like literally coin flipping. Yeah, with Nurgle, I, I at least I know I'm going to take a lot of damage, but I know if I just live with one health. You just need one, just one, need wound, one wound. And then he's going to go off. So um, that's the tough thing about playing elites in this game. And Legionnaire is, is no difference. Um and I honestly, I don't think it's. I think they're better than intercession, right now. Oh yeah, I don't. Point. I don't think it's close. Um, I think right now, weirdly, I think Phobos is the best elite team, just because everything's gotten better at killing elites. But Phobos were already dying the easiest anyway, so it didn't really yeah. change anything for them. So they can still play their game. And I mean, like they're three, four bolters. They can still yeah. mess up a Casterkin. Like it's weird. You know? cause it's like Phobos didn't get better. Like all, all the, the elites, elites around them just got worse. Yeah, so like Phobos just stayed yeah. where they were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talons is, is really good. Too a today. sinking yeah. tide raises one ship. And, you know, it's pretty soon Nemesis Claw comes out. So maybe so Night excited. Lords are going to be the, the new oh, thing. I hope they're good. I don't know what they could do to make, to like alleviate these problems that I'm talking about that the elites have. But uh, I'm really curious to see what, what happens. And I'm excited yeah. to get those on the table. Yeah, me too. Uh, but yeah, I think 
I think that's that about wraps it up. I deep think deep dive. Did we do it? I think we did finally. We've been yeah. promising it for like six months. So there you go. <laughs> um, that's the wisdom, guys. Take the anointed. Uh, don't take the flamer. Don't take the flamer. <laughs> don't build the flamer. We already know you're not going to take the flamer, so just don't build it. Yeah. I mean, waste, you, waste of a model. You can build that model, and then you'll look at the rules, and you'll you'll you won't take it. Yeah. So just don't do it until the the update comes where you get a free seventh model, and it has to be a flamer. That's <laughs> yeah. when you take the flamer. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So take us. You can get us out of here. Ryan. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, first and foremost, we do have to thank uh, Millennium Games for allowing us to use their studio to record the Command Point podcast. Big ups to them. Uh, check out the uh, the link to their website down in the description below. Uh, shout out Jonah, the producer. The producer. For uh, working on, uh, on all the technical difficulties that we were having earlier tonight. I really appreciate you being here, man. Without this week... Without you being here, we could not have done this without you. So I really appreciate it. We would have been it. hopeless. Hopeless. Chickens with our heads cut off. Yeah. I would have just given up <laughs> and just like recorded <laughs> yeah. on the DSLR at home or something. Um, special shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are what keeps the channel afloat here. And uh, special thank you to all of our subscribers on YouTube. You know, we're we're getting to 10. This is we're the year. There. We're plugging this along. This is the year. That yeah. we're getting to 10K subscribers. So, shout out to you guys. If you like our content, make sure to share it. Check out the Discord channel. I don't have anything else for you guys. Thanks yeah. for watching and listening. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Adios.